well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ron Fisher, and uh, um, I would like to thank uh, Michael Bernard for his introduction, um, the GMU for inviting us here, and uh, the ITF for also inviting me in particular to this conference. Um, what I would like to talk about is uh, renegotiations, of course, which is the topic of our conference. And what I want to point out is that, um, as Michael said, not oh, uh, uh, in, most ca in many cases, renegotiations do not respond to events that occur in the future, like uh, adaptations that you need, for instance, to increase demand for the uh, project or something like that. But really, um, a lot of them seem to be um, in con with the connivance, both of the state and the regulator. And in particular, I'm going to look at it from the political economic point of view. So um, this paper is joint work with Eduardo Engel and uh, Alexander Galetovich from the Universidad de Chile and Universidad de Los Andes, respectively. And we have just written a book on this, came out last week, at least came to us last week. So <laughs> I have to put in a pitch for that. <laughs> just in <laughs> well, um, uh, the, the, um, this paper, uh, in, in general, people have, have uh, talked about the fact that that concessions and PVPs can be used and have been used to exceed spending limits by the government. What uh, I would like to point out is that renegotiations can be used to add to that effect. Um, and the reason why PVPs can do it and uh, public provision, the normal standard public provision cannot, is that um, in, in PVPs you bundle finance and construction and that allows the, the private party to lend, in a sense to lend, uh, in, in quotes, to the, to the public uh, entity uh, in, and, and uh, uh, to add additional things, to tag additional things onto the project. And that is due to the fact that you, you, the fiscal accounting rules are not perfect. They, we, we sh we, one of the reasons that we, one of the things that we can do to reduce at least this sort of effect is to improve on the fiscal accounting rules, to see how much um, uh, how, how much uh, the debt has increased, the implicit debt has increased when you do a renegotiation. Um, let me give you an example, uh, in a couple of examples. In 2001, there was flooding in Santiago, and there was a lot of political pressure on, on the government to, uh, to invest in, in collectors for uh, rainwater, and main collectors. But the government was unwilling because of the its spending commitments to put these resources itself directly. So what they did is they renegotiated contracts for urban highways so they would build the drains. Basically they added like $300 million to the original contract just so they could build the drains. This didn't appear anywhere in the, in the budget. Everybody agreed and that happened. Another case um, is uh, and the other thing is that most of the expenditure will be paid by future users who will pay for the, for, for, the, for the highway. So in a sense, it was transferred to these people without any, any possibility of them saying anything about it. Um, another Chilean case, since uh, basically it's easier to do cases when you're in the, in the place because you know about them. Um, the, the, the main port of Chile was hampered by a lack of a dedicated access to trucks that had to go straight through the city. So uh, there were three options to make a bypass. Either you could fund it with current fiscal resources, which the country did have. Um, you, could either ha you could have an independent PVP that charged tolls for, for trucks on trucks, or you could have a non-toll extension of another route which was already a PVP, a toll PVP. As a candidate, the, the, current, the president then had promised not to, impose, not to impose tolls on the bypass, and therefore they renegotiated the contract, and they valued the project at a certain amount, and they increased the tolls on the other route to cover the increased expense. Um, there's no independent valuation of the bypass, no, no competition, no nothing. So that gave us the idea that there is a political, um, uh, th that one of the political, uh, one of the reasons for renegotiations is the interest of the parties in renegotiation itself, both the government and the firms. Um, well, I'll skip this because I said it. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction to the model. Very brief, I won't, I won't go into any deep mathematics. But I just, this is a basic idea. You have 
a Congress that allocates spending and it decides that it's going to spend, you, you have a tax uh, budget, a tax revenue of uh, one over two periods and you have expenditure over two periods of the, to the same amount. Your social welfare function is given by the investment in public infrastructure or the services it provides. And what you do then, in, a, in the case in which, which we assume in which there was no discounting just to simplify, is that investment is split in halves. That's what you do. So that should be the optimal. The problem is that government has a different utility function. The utility function of the government depends on the utility of, of society, but only if it gets re-elected. So um, it includes the probability of re-election to the future, and that means that it biases spending towards the present because um, uh, infrastructure spending and the services it provides are uh, powerful issues in an election. So if you have m more hospitals, more uh, highways and things like that, people do believe you're a good government and they tend to re-elect you. So um, this biases government to current spending. The problem is how to manage it. Uh, Congress, in general, will, uh, will authorize, because it maximizes social welfare, assuming that, uh, it authorizes only spending of one half in its period, but the problem is it cannot supervise the agreements between the, uh, uh, the Public Works Authority and the PVP. So it's difficult to supervise, they don't have a specialized agency to do that. Um, and uh, so what happens is that if you have public provision, and standard public provision, what government does is it has to pay, or at least if the, 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 you have to pay the companies at the end of each period. You can't, the companies uh, cannot incur in debt. Then they're paid on the basis of work done. So you can't pass things from one period to the rest, so to a second one. Whereas when you have a PPP, uh, what happens is the following. In the PPP you can, transfer debt from one period to the other one through the company itself, through the PPP company. So what will happen is that the companies know that they will renegotiate the contract in the future, in the first period, uh, for political reasons, because the government wants to spend more. And uh, because they will renegotiate, uh, depending on the bargaining power they have, they will uh, underbid, they will, I'm sorry, depending on the bargaining power they have exposed, they will get a certain amount of the uh, surplus from the renegotiation. Because it's a surplus from renegotiation, that means that by competition you have to eliminate that, and that means that the companies will lowball originally. So companies will lowball, and of course you will get cost overruns on the initial lowballing of the contract. Um, so, and, and, and that can be split, and eventually the, we'll sh we show that the government exceeds the spending limit. I won't go into the details, but basically there are two reasons why, um, well, um, I, I th that's the mathematics showing why the government wants to spend more in, in the present. First, because um, it doesn't value the future as much, because it might not be re-elected, and second, because more investment means that it has a high probability of re-election. So there are two reasons for, um, to, to desire higher investment in the present. So how would you implement the, the optimal? Uh, remember that um, the government wants additional work. So uh, f assuming that firms have expectations about the future, they expect to make additional works for W, an additional, uh, and and because it's renegotiated, the amount they will, have, they will get for that is R. So the utility of the incumbent under those conditions is the one that appears there. So it's in the first period, you get the utility uh, of uh, one half plus W plus additional works, and that increases the probability of re-election by the same amount. But in the second period, you have lower utility, but it doesn't count by as much. Um, and because the firm obtains a rent, it will lowball the contract so by competition. So uh, L there is the extent of lowballing. So what happens is the firms go in for a lower price, knowing that in the future they will renegotiate the contract. And in a sense, the government has, for the first period, has that extra money that it had not considered 
um, uh, it's, it, it's not something that you can renegotiate. It's already uh, in its hands. So um, what you have then is that low bowling is transferred to the incumbent and not part of the renegotiation process. So if you have efficient, this of course uh, uh, an hypothetical model, but if you have efficient bargaining and competition, the incumbent can attain its optimal choice. So exactly what it wanted. Um, for instance, in the case, that the only case I'm going to put here is the case in which the firm has all the bargaining power. So the incumbent gains nothing exposed. What does that mean? That the problem for the bidder is to maximize the difference between what it gets in renegotiation minus what it um, has to work for, W, and subject to the condition that the utility of the, um, of the government is the same as if it did not incur in renegotiations. And notice that in that case, because of low bowling, the, uh, the government already has an L in place, uh, a capital L in place on the right-hand side. And turns out that when you solve this problem, that's a nice thing, the first order conditions that result are the same as the first order conditions of the incumbent. That is to say that when the firm maximizes, it achieves what the government wants to get in addition works. So, uh, and that's, that's the main result, and this applies for any bargaining power of the incumbent, and thus we have that governments include addition works during renegotiations, and they're interested in them, and there's no, in a sense, opposition between the government and the private party, they're both in agreement. Renegotiations occur early during construction, That's so it's easier to add additional things. The cost of renegotiations is passed on to future administrations, and first the firms can make loss-making bids, which they recover during renegotiations. There's some extensions that I won't go into, but I want to point out that, um, that this could be solved by, by accounting fiscally for PPPs correctly. And uh, for instance, uh, as you know, Eurostat has tried to do this for a long time. And in 2004, they assigned PPPs to the fiscal balance sheet if the private party bore some risks. And it led to the uh, PFI uh, cases in, in the UK, which have not been a good example. Eurostat 2010 uses a control approach in which uh, the party who is in ultimate control determines if the PVP is in the balance sheet. Uh, an alternative is to go back to the RIO rules and include all PVPs in fiscal accounts. Um, nowadays, uh, Eurostat 2013 includes contingent obligations but in a separate account. Um, in Chile, Colombia and some other countries, you apply standard financial tools to value these liabilities. But on the other hand, it's not clear that the renegotiated amounts are included at all in the fiscal accounts. So that's something that should be uh, looked at. The w in, in 2009, uh, we did a detailed examination of PVPs in Chile and renegotiations. And um, renegotiations were worth more than 30% of the initial value of the projects on average. And, and in fact, most of the predictions of the model held, of the model, theoretical model. There's a substantial fraction of renegotiations during construction. There are additional works tacked on to future governments, and, 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 the, and the expenditure is loaded into future governments. So I, I won't go into, uh, there's a more recent paper by Bitran Nieto and that looks at three countries in Latin America. I, will, I won't look into much of the data because Jose Luis is probably going to go into that much, but these three countries have between them about 56 uh, concessions in, road, in the road sector, um, and um, they've had a lot of renegotiations. I just want to look at some data on them, and not this one, but some graphs that I'll show you. Um, this is a data that shows um, f for each, each uh, the, the, ups, the, the um, uh, x axis shows a concession. So one is num the first concession, two is the second concession, etc for Chile and Peru, and that shows the amount renegotiated during construction. As you can see, there's a lot of variation. Some concessions do have, or PVPs have no renegotiations whatsoever, and others have uh, large 
amounts of, of renegotiation. Um, it's not clear exactly the reason. Uh, we've been trying to figure out if it has to, if it's close to election time or not, but we don't know. Uh, we haven't, I mean, we haven't been able to do that yet because it's difficult to determine the time at which that happens. Um, in Colombia, on the other hand, numbers are a bit higher. Uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers for, for, uh, for Peru and Chile, they're, they're on average about 30% with some spikes, uh, a big spikes, like 70% in one case in Peru. But in Colombia, the numbers are much, much higher. There are lots of them that go over 100% and some reach up to 600%. So, so I couldn't even put in the same scale, so that's why I had to separate it into two graphs. And the second one that I want to show you is, if you look, if, if, if you divide um, PVPs by the, the age that they have, so you group all the ones that have one, a, one year of age, two years of age, etc., what you see, those are the graphs that you see there of the amount renegotiated as percentage of PVPs. So, uh, for instance, for the case of the median, you see that for the first six concessions, uh, for, the, for concessions in the first six years, the median amount renegotiated is about, I don't know, two and a half percent in Chile, as you can see. But as you go into the sixth to tenth, it rises to about 15 percent in the years six to ten. Um, but on the other hand, there are some concessions, uh, those you can see uh, in the upper percentile 75 percent which are renegotiated far more often and far earlier in the first three to five years mm. and they renegotiate about 25 percent of the project so um, but looking at Colombia in Colombia if you look at the median for instance that appears there you can see that there were two, con two uh, a few concessions that are the ones that explain most of the problems and those are the early ones the ones that are oldest uh, and, and they have a large chunk of, um, of their negotiated amounts. But even then, if you go to concessions that, started ten years, uh, that are 10 years old, that at least have ten, uh, 10 years of age, you see that there's about double, uh, by the graph it's not so clear, but, but it, uh, the, the concession amounts are about, the negotiated amounts are about double those for, um, those for Chile. So until at least, um, well, if concessions are 10 years old, then uh, they must be for something like 2004. So at least until 2000, the concessions awarded in 2004, um, things were not going too well. On the other hand, new concessions seem to be doing much, much better. Apparently they changed the rules. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, for Peru, Peru has a shorter time experience. Um, and you can see that the numbers they look a bit more like Chile. Okay, they, they they don't have, they don't show a lot of um, renegotiations. On the other hand, they are very um, young. It's a very young system, so it doesn't. It's only seven years old, at least for the data that that Vitran has, Vitran Nieto and Robledo have. So uh, I will skip the type of renegotiations, um, but point out just one thing that most negotiations are by mutual agreement and that is because there's very little opposition between government and the private parties. They want to get to an agreement. So there's no conflict and, and so one of the things that one would want to, 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 to do is to put some sort of supervisor that has an adversarial relationship with the private party because right now there's collaboration and when the private party and the government collaborate that's not very good for um, for the public purse. So um, you would want to have somebody independent that's uh, verifying that. On the other hand, government will try to avoid that. Uh, I know because I'm in a panel that tries to do that and <laughs> we, we, we never get a case because they don't want to come to us. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, um, so you have to do it somehow that they're compelled to go in some way or there's an agency that has that as its main task, not as an arbitration a panel, but as a main task, uh, and has the resources to do it too. Um, so, in the standard interpretation, and in the the let's say incomplete information interpretation, you get more renegotiations as time passes. But we see lots of renegotiations taking place in the first few years, 
there could be several interpretations. One is incompetence and cover up by an incumbent, and that's, I'm sure, part of the explanation. Um, the governments don't want to spend money, at least the middle income countries don't want, the, the governments don't want to spend money or um, in, 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 uh, um, in planning a project really carefully. Uh, in fact, I had one minister tell it to me saying, look, uh, what's the benefit? You spend two years and about 10% of the, of the money of the project in planning it to get it to be a really good project, but then it's for the next minister. So why would I want to do that? Uh, <laughs> so it's a first person uh, thing. Um, the other thing is that you want to add additional uh, infrastructure without and avoid the budgetary process. And of course, firms want to recoup from the low ball offer. And these last two are part of our model. Um, the incompetence one, uh, I think is also important and I'm not sure it, it's, uh, we haven't, m we haven't uh, modeled incompetence yet. Uh, it could be an important or interesting thing to try to do. Um, well, I'll skip this. So to conclude, because of the fiscal accounting loopholes, PVPs have allowed incumbents to exceed infrastructure spending limits. That's the PFI case. But um, a further political motive for PVPs is that contract renegotiations allow additional spending. So that's another reason that you want that comp that uh, governments like PVPs and they like renegotiations. Um, the analysis that we had. Uh, gave rise to a series of predictions that were broadly consistent with the data that we've seen at least for Chile, Peru, and Colombia. Um, and on the other hand, the data showed that there are substantial differences among countries on the magnitude of renegotiations. And it could be because of differences in institutional settings, because of lack of experience, or just luck. Uh, but <laughs> we haven't figured out yet that the reason for the differences. Uh, that's it. Thank you.